Hello and welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast, Episode 11, Breaking Down Barriers with Jason Max Ferdinand. I'm Chris Muntz, the host of the show, and in this episode, I sit down with the biggest star, I think, in the coral world right now. Dr. Ferdinand of the famed Aeolians is fresh off their world-changing performance at the National ACDA Conference in Kansas City this spring. Our topics in the show are wide-ranging, including his upbringing in the Caribbean and early life, his planning process for the ACDA, his approach to sound in the choir, as well as the proper approach to spirituals. We discuss racial stereotypes in choral music and the social significance of the Aeolians' rise to prominence. I hope you enjoy. Before we get to Dr. Ferdinand, I just want to tell you a little bit about what I'm doing now with Sight Reading Factory. Sight Reading Factory is one of the sponsors of this show, and I'm very grateful to have them involved. I very recently decided to take the leap into student memberships on sightreadingfactory.com. I've used the teacher membership for quite a while, but for next school year, I'm getting each student an individual membership, which means they can practice at home, unlimited amounts of exercises, and I can keep track of the progress and what level they're doing, give them assignments, all kinds of features on there open up when your students have access. So head over to sightreadingfactory.com and check out that feature. Use promo code CORELOSOPHY to get 10% off at checkout. I would also love it if you would head over to ryanmain.com and check out the catalog of an independently published composer and arranger who is just doing awesome things for young singers right now. And I would encourage you, if you have singers in the age group of anywhere from junior high to high school, he is an excellent resource for you. So head over to ryanmain.com and check out his material and enter also Coralosophy at that checkout for 10% off. OMG, you guys, this conversation that I'm about to play for you was so much fun to record. It was a breath of fresh air. But I got to tell you, I was nervous as heck going into this conversation because I have never met Jason. I, of course, was in all of the fangirl and fanboy buzz during the ACDA convention, and I've been a huge fan of the Aeolians for years. So this was a harrowing task to try to approach a lot of topics with this icon currently in the choral field. So once we started talking, though, within a few seconds, I was at ease, and we just settled into a really awesome conversation that I think that you're going to learn a lot from and really enjoy getting to know more of what makes Jason Ferdinand tick. As always on this show, we're, we talk quite a bit about the philosophies behind what we do in our choral ensembles, and this interview is no exception. Uh, we talk about quite a, th a few things that you may or may not agree with our perspective on this, and so this is another opportunity for me to remind you that we have a Facebook group that is closed so we can have private conversations for listeners on the of the show to reflect and respond in a in a public way in that group on Coralosophers on Facebook if you'd like to uh, either highlight or ask questions about anything that we talk about in this episode that you should head on over to Coralosophers and join that group but if you'd also like to shoot me an email directly and challenge something I've said or uh, ask a question about something that happens on the show, you are more than welcome to do that at Coralosophy at gmail.com. So without any further ado, here is the talk. Okay, I'm here with Jason Ferdinand, who is the chair of music at Oakwood University and director of choral activities there. And as many of you know, the director of the group, Aeoli the Aeolians. And we're here to talk today about breaking down barriers and learn a little bit more about uh, what makes Jason tick and what makes uh, him the intrepid choral director that we all know he is. So welcome, Jason. Thank you so much, Chris. Well, I'm excited to have you and excited to have you uh, uh, share your thoughts and, and just banter back and forth a little bit with you today. Mm -hmm. uh, so could you start us out by just uh, telling everybody who listens uh, who who are you? Let's do the let's do the life story. Where do you come from? Uh, what got what what has gotten you from your little boy Jason days to mm -hmm. doing doing all the stuff that you do now? Well, I was born in the Twin Island Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, which is the most southern isle of the Caribbean uh, archipelago. So right uh, right next to Venezuela, right above Venezuela. Um, born and raised. Um, to two parents that were educators. 
Uh, matter of fact, my mother was my elementary school teacher twice. <laughs> um, wow. Uh, and in Trinidad, uh, we went to the British kind of schooling system. So did all levels there, what you guys would call like high school here. And then the advanced levels, um, which is kind of like post high school and somewhere in between college. And during that time, I was actually studying to be a medical doctor. Um, so I kind of specialized then in biology, chemistry, physics. Uh, that's how the structure was then. But then decided to follow my passion. Um, must have been 1996 when I made that decision. Now, if you're from any island in the Caribbean, um, doing music as a profession is not a thing. <laughs> and unless you're doing like calypso or soca or reggae, but classical music is like, what? Um, so my parents had to make the decision to send me to to North America to study. So I came to Oakwood um, and did my junior and senior year here studying studying music. So, you know, all along I was doing music. So it, it was just something that I just had to follow as opposed to what I was doing and learning and kind of ran out of that joy. Wow, that's interesting. So since you on your island then, if if doing classical music as a career is not a thing, as you said, where did that influence come from? Well. Um, my dad, in, in particular, was a, an administrator at the university in Trinidad. And at that time, the president of the university, who had a doctorate in education, I would believe, but he was also a very, very good musician. So uh, Dr. Andrews played the pipe organ for church every now and then. And he was a wonderful baritone and conductor. So I always had musical stimuli. And there were a lot of people who knew classical music and did classical music, but it was never their straight on profession. They always did something else. So okay. I was just always intrigued. Um, and I guess the passion just overwhelmed me that I can, you know, I can resist it. Wow. Okay. So uh, stay, stay with me just a little bit on the island still in your, in your English style education that you grew up in what kind since uh, we do talk a lot about education on this show mm -hmm. uh, what were some of the pros and cons you can remember of being educated that way especially now that you uh, have been in the U.S. for a while maybe things that are there pros and cons to the way you were educated yeah. that maybe kids in the U.S. don't get um yes there, there are pros and cons um I think, and this is just personal opinion, I think the British system is a little, uh, it, 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 it takes off the creme de la creme early, early in life, which I think could be a little unfair to those who are not part of the creme de la creme. And you mm -hmm. have to choose way earlier in your life. Like I'm talking about, you know, from the time you're 13 or 14, you have to choose your path. You either want to do business, social sciences, or the medical thing. Mm -hmm. um, so so that that could be good and especially if you know from early what you want to do exactly or it could be bad if you don't know and then you kind of pigeon hold into choosing something very quickly so that's why i mentioned that i was doing biology chemistry physics because that's what i thought i was going to do um mm -hmm. so those are some you know some of the the cons i would say the pros it, now, in, in terms of music one thing i loved about growing up in the caribbean and following the british system the Royal Schools of Music out of London is what we basically did. And I just always loved the way everything was uh, leveled out. So grade one, you expect to know this material. Grade two, you do this. And everyone was just very, very sure of uh, what your level was. When I came to the States, initially it was a little confusing as to where I was in terms of my piano playing. And fortunately, when I came to Oakwood, there was a professor here who is from England who kind of explained it to the rest of the music faculty. They said, ah, okay, I see. He did this. So this kind of equivalents to this part of the system. So, okay. So I, I, I kind of like the demarcations in the British system a, a little bit. But uh -huh. pigeonholeness of, of having to choose very, very early. Yeah. Yeah, I've, we've kind of uh, gone into on an earlier episode of my show here, some of the pros and cons actually bringing up the British system mm. as it re as it relates to choral music, because I, I had a chance to sing years ago for Simon Carrington, and nice. he uh, he talked to us quite a bit about some of those pros and cons, and we compared them to the, the American choral music education system, which is uh, way more inclusive in the sense that l large, large numbers of kids exactly. across the country get to sing, and that's a pro, in the sense that they're, they're getting access to learning choral music 
uh, the the pro of the British system, in depending on how you look at it, is that you get you get those high high level music achievers all in one place and right. can do the and can do these amazing things, which which we can't necessarily do at every school right. in the U.S. And, and and so there's a little bit of a mixed bag there. And I wonder if you kind of experienced that too. Well, in terms of music, I probably didn't have that. The British system on a whole did not come down that way in terms of music. So let me explain a little bit. So, you know, from below age 10, I never sensed any kind of, there was no kind of special group singing high level choral music. There was a children's choir at church and we did that. And I kind of enjoyed that because at that point I was just having fun just to sing and have fun. Um, Music in the Caribbean, though, the music classes were mainly built around, you know, folk songs and calypso sort of things. So it wasn't what Simon Carrington was describing, you know, with the boy choir system. And, oh, okay. You're right. It's, it's totally different in that respect when it comes to the British system. The, the island still kept some of their, their uh, you know, traditions. Okay. So then after you came to the U.S. and you did, you finished your degree at Oakwood, mm -hmm. uh, th then what? Where'd you go after that? So I finished at Oakwood and I went on to Morgan State University in Baltimore, Maryland. I had the privilege there of studying with uh, a guy by the name of Dr. Nathan Carter, who was a giant for many, for many period, and then a giant for many African-American musicians coming up. Um, he had a very interesting background. Grew up in Selma, Alabama. If you know anything about Selma, the, mm -hmm. all the history there. Mm -hmm. um, when went on to Hampton University, did a piano degree, and then got accepted to Juilliard on probation. I guess they saw the talent, but he wasn't quite there yet. But then graduated top of his class at Juilliard, and uh, then went on to Peabody, and then spent 34 years at Morgan State University. And uh, he literally changed my life. And in those two years, he single-handedly changed my life when it comes when it came to making music a profession. Uh-huh. Um, what were some of the, the critical things you learned from him that make you say now that he changed your life? Well, first, Dr. Carter had a way of just seeing great potential in what we'll call the least of these. I mean, I've, I saw him change lives of kids coming from inner city Philadelphia or inner city Baltimore, uh, coming in with terrible high school GPAs, but but showing them, hey, you you have a future in this music thing. So I could I could go so many names that are now singing the Metropolitan Opera, singing in opera houses around the world. Um, Darren Ed Waters conducting the Soulful Symphony in Maryland. I could go on and on and on. He just had a way of cultivating talent and being able to see it even before the rest of us can even see it. But he, he always saw it in you. And he, he, was, he was a very strong disciplinarian, but you would quickly figure out that if, if he was hard on you, it's because he really cared. If he didn't mm -hmm. care, he would tell you nothing. Um, but um, he, just, he just instilled in me a discipline and, a, and a, a passion to look. You could really do this and make this your career. So you know, let's just buckle down and get it done. Mm-hmm. Well, that's that's wonderful. So then, what 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 happened next? Um, so I left Morgan State University in the spring of two thousand one, and went on to a boarding academy in Pine Forge, Pennsylvania, a hmm. Adventist boarding school that at the time had about two hundred students, maybe. And I directed the choirs there for seven years. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. That's that's interesting and yeah. uh, you, a unique way to teach. So that all the students lived there on campus. Were yeah. they what what age? This was high school, so grade nine to twelve. Oh, okay. Yeah, great. And then uh, and then from there to Oakwood, or is there more? No. Nope. Nope. So um, about three or four years into that experience, I um, applied to the doctoral program at the University of Maryland. So uh -huh. there were. Three years was actually doing Maryland school and doing the Pine Forge Academy Corps. So what happened is that they allowed me to move to Maryland, and I had an assistant that would rehearse the corps in Pennsylvania during the week. And on Fridays, I'll take the train up to Philadelphia, and someone will pick me up, and I'll do the choir on Friday. And if we had a tour or something, I'll do that on the weekend. So so for a while there, there was a you know intermingling of you know school and working. Mm -hmm. So it was. So but go ahead. No, I was going to ask when on in the boarding school when you were teaching high school age kids, what was your 
ensemble structure like that's a relatively <laughs> small school so how did how did they put ensembles together well well first of all pine forge academy is a school that's known for a very very strong choral program so i kind of went in inheriting this great bunch of talents and kids and it was very very simple it was literally one choir essentially and um i would have a hundred kids in the choir so oh, half wow. the school and um some years we would do like a more select type of group or we have a traveling group. So, so you can call that two choirs if you want to call it that. But um, Pine Forge was a great, uh, I call it my experiment, experimenting ground. The, the kids would do anything you put in front of them. And um, I look back now and say like, why did I teach them that? That's, but but they, they would sing anything. I mean, I taught their movements on the Brahms Requiem, <laughs> which in retrospect, would I do that now? Probably not. But but they handled it and we did great repertoire and I was able to kind of dabble and figure out what worked and what didn't work. It was a great time for me. Wow. And so then finishing the doctorate in Maryland and, and did you go directly then back to Oakwood? So I left Maryland, actually ABD, and then came down to Oakwood in 2008. And then okay. I finished. I finished my dissertation whilst whilst here at Oakwood. Was that always a dream at all uh, to go back to Oakwood, or did that no. was it happen happenstance? You know, it's going back when you asked me. You know what happened after Trinidad. When I came to Oakwood and I left here, honestly, and I tell all my students now, don't do what I did. I didn't have a clear vision at all of what I was going to do. I did a piano degree here, and the story of how I got to Morgan State is pretty interesting. And I'll just give you the short version. We we went to a choral competition in Las Vegas in, uh, this would be the spring of 1999. And um, my teacher at Oakwood University at the time uh, also did his master's at Morgan State University. So there was one day we were just kind of hanging out with the Morgan State Choir and Dr. Carter, the guy I mentioned before, he looked at me and he said, um, someone told me you're about to do your piano recital. And I, and I said, yes. So right there in the spot in front of his entire choir, he says, okay, let me hear you play something. So I played, I think some Rachmaninoff, Prelude, and C-sharp minor. And I got like halfway through and he said, okay, stop, that, that's enough. He said, you also conduct, do you? And I said, yeah, I try. So he had me conduct right there in the spot, his choir. And when I was done, he said to me, okay, I'm gonna make you my graduate assistant next year. So I graduated and went to Morgan. So really, I'm sharing that to say I had no idea really what I was going to be doing. And that uh-huh. that story right there kind of, uh, you know, shaped the rest of my life because I went to Morgan and then decided for sure I want to be a choral conductor. Wow. That's a that's such a great story. And I think sometimes our our accidental life choices <laughs> end up being end up being our best ones because yeah. we're just letting life take us where we where we need to go. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, all right. So you just I'm trying to keep it all all straight now. So from 2008, then you've been at Oakland. Exactly right. Okay, um, and 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 the Aeolians, I understand, are, is an ensemble that predates your time there. That's oh, yeah. that's a choir that's been there for a long, long time. Is that true? Since 1946, um, wow. formed by a lady by the name of Eva B. Dykes. Okay, and has it always um, has it always been? Uh, a similar sized ensemble that approaches a wide range of repertoire? Is it relatively intact in its traditions? Um, I would say over the years, each director kind of gave a slightly different spin. So for example, I could think of the years 1968 to 70 when there was a guy by the name of um, Dr. Jan Robertson, who later went on to be chair of the music department at UCLA. He had he had a, a huge choir, 100 plus, 120, I believe, but he also had a smaller group from the Aeolians of about 20 or something like that. Um, Alma Blackman, who was another famed Aeolian director, her groups tended to be pretty big. Um, when I was a student here, my professor kind of did something interesting. He had the Aeolians and the university choir, and oftentimes we would rehearse together. And then on the trips or special concerts, you'll see that separation. Over the years here, I've I, I also did the university choir and the Aeolians for about uh, nine years. Okay. And um, so the Aeolians tended to be about 60 people, the university choir, 100 people in a good year. But over the years, I've kind of been cutting back, cutting back. So last year we had 46. Next year, I'm thinking about going on to like 40. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'm just, of course, anyone in who's listening to this show, if they didn't know who you and the aliens were, 
uh, they definitely did after the ACDA convention uh, not too wow. long ago. Of course, you guys made a huge splash there. Now, I I don't mean to sound like a hipster, and that I, I I liked the Aeolians before they were cool at <laughs> at, at, at ACDA. Um, I've been I've been showing. I shared this with you in an email prior to the show that I've been showing videos for wow. years uh, in my classroom. I'll give you give you a little bit of background on on where I am now, uh, so that you can have the context. I teach in this in the high school that I grew up in. Oh, so wow. I wow. so I, I I left and came back, and and it's a very large Midwestern uh, suburban program. We've got over three hundred singers, and wow. and and when I was a student here, uh, just to give you an idea of how the community has changed, I graduated with a gra a class of four hundred and fifty kids. Wow, uh, six of whom were of color. <laughs> Gotcha. Um, now, it, the community has changed so much that we are now a, a multiracial, multi-ethnic community um, that that is still uh, still majority white, but it's it's representative closer and closer every year to uh, to what the country's right. demographic makeup is. And um, and so one of the things that I discovered right away was the value in the in uh, in showing. Uh, performance experiences and performance examples mm -hmm. to my students that represented all of them. Right. Um, and uh, because uh, there were, there is a certain amount of uh, when a student comes into the classroom in a choral music classroom at age 14, and they've never maybe been exposed to choral music mm -hmm. uh, the way, the way we're teaching it, uh, that there is a certain stereotype that they will place upon themselves. Mm -hmm. And I, I remember the first time I showed an Aeolians video to my ninth grade uh, 70 voice oh. boys choir, boys choir, oh. um, in the 15, 15 or 20, uh, young black boys in there. And they see the Aeolians come on the screen and their eyes get wide and they oh. start look, looking at each other and like, like they've never seen anything like that before. And I can tell you instantly mm. their, their response to the learning in the classroom was different. Oh. Um, th they, they no longer saw um, now, of course, I'm oversimplifying it in the sense that I also have to provide context and I have to, uh, you know, establish a rapport with them over time and yeah, all of that. Yeah, so yeah. it's not a it's not a magic pill. But just by by them seeing an example of uh, of students that even look like them mm -hmm. can do this music was was transformative for me. Wow. And then not to mention and for the kids, then I become this fan of the ensemble <laughs> and start and start listening to it. And of course, all my kids know who they are now and who wow. you guys are. And um, and so I, I wonder if um, have you ever thought about that and how the, how your ensemble might have an effect on kids outside of your sphere? Well, first of all, let me just say that's that's very, very, very humbling on that story. I have to share that with my students in the fall. But, um, you, you know, Chris, it's interesting. The first time I think we had a serious discussion about our influence outside of what we see and what we do was during our preparation for ACDA. Mm -hmm. And, and I'll, I have to tell you this, I, I can't even take credit for bringing it to the forefront. I'll, I'll tell you who, who did. And um, it's interesting. It, it took a Caucasian friend of mine to come into my rehearsal room to share with us the importance of what you just said. Mm -hmm. So, and I'll, I'll call his name, my dear friend, Bruce Rogers from California, Mount San Antonio. Uh, he came in to work with us for a couple of days and he shared with us the importance of uh, grasping, owning, and not feeling any sort of way to represent who we are. Um, you know, and one of our songs in particular, our closer at AC Day really was a, was a song speaking to the journey of, you know, African-American people here in America being free and saying, hey, we, we are here too. And he said, do not sing it with any sort of apologetic tone. You just go for it. And it was only then that Bruce said, you know, you guys now have to, one, you have to own it, and now you have the obligation to uh, show to the whole world um, who you are, what you do, and stay true, and don't change for anyone. So, so yeah, so it was during our preparation to AC Day that, that, that your sentiment became something true for us. And 
it was just amazing to me. It still kind of baffles me at the response and people saying, you know, man, we, we listen to you guys all the time. We look at this, we look at that. Because for us, we were just doing it. You know, sometimes when you're in something, you don't really get to see the impact you're having. But um, mm-hmm. um, that that's something we think about a lot now. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. And, and I, I think it's it's an interesting thing that so much kind of emotion and almost politicization mm-hmm. around around race happens so much that sometimes we don't feel comfortable having conversations like this. Right. And and one of the things I've noticed with my kids is that there's a certain with my students is that there's a certain amount of stereotyping uh, that they do without even realizing they're doing it and and it's not just and it's not just white students stereotyping black students or hispanic students it's sometimes doing it to themselves yeah um is that that if i <laughs> you know i if i um grow up in a, around a certain culture that means i have to sing a certain way or right. behave a certain way and and some sometimes that idea you hear the word representation a lot now a representation of different people from different backgrounds participating in different types of activities it can be uh, eye opening especially if you're 14 and you're already worried about how other people see you and are you uh are you projecting to the world the the image that you think right. it wants right. and all of that and and so i think in those types of things in our world here at the high school uh have have been i think contributing factors to uh well i'll just i'm a pretty blunt person so i'll just say it this way um uh, the de-whitification of my choir program Mm. The, the, when when I came here 15 years ago, uh, we had a lot of black students in the school, but they didn't sing in choir. Right. Right. Um, and uh, and part of that might be uh, because it was a stereotype placed on them by society, by themselves, by other students, right. that it, it took me piecing away at those assumptions, right. uh, in part by showing videos of the Aeolians or, or showing videos of Eric Owens' bass, yeah. you know, uh, famous african-american base um you know those types of things and and helping them see potential in themselves that they didn't know was there right right and 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 that going back to my you know one of my mentors dr carter you know one thing i did mention earlier was he was able to show us that he could be and music could be and our ensemble could be all things to all people i've never seen anyone who was so apt at I mean, he could be in a Baptist church one minute and then flip a coin and be doing Bach the next. It was incredible to see. His, 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 he came from a long line of Baptist, Baptist ministers. His dad was a Baptist minister. His brother was a Baptist minister. So he had that kind of church in him. But going to Juilliard and Peabody, he could just flip a dime and do something else very, very, very well. And, um, and he showed us, like, you, you, could do, you could do anything you choose to do. And, um, and, and stay, still stay true to style and performance practice, but, you know, bring you to it. And um, he, he was my biggest influence when it came to that. Mm-hmm. Now, do you have any experience with uh, whether – now, your, your upbringing being not in the U.S. as a child yeah. might change this, but maybe you've seen it in your students. Have you ever uh, talked to students that, that go through this kind of transition of, of societal – stereotypes for what kind of music they should like and and ha- have you seen that at all i have i have seen it and um and perhaps i address it and probably even view it from a different perspective based on the first thing you just said you know trinidad the racial climate is is almost not even a thing you know i came here and i'm like hey, white black like what is going on like I, I didn't grow up like this so i tend to see things um slightly differently but do i sense it i do sense it um especially teaching at, at hbcu a historically black college and university you hear the kids talking like that all the time oh well we, we're not supposed to do this we're supposed to do this i'm like what are, what are you talking about like that that's a myth like um you can do whatever you want to do but Again, depending on how they were brought up and what they've seen, like you just said, they tend to stereotype themselves and mm-hmm. um, put themselves in these little boxes. And um, so, so I have to speak to that a whole lot. Um, you know, I'm, as chair of the music department, they put themselves in certain tracks. I'm like, wait, hold on. Like, he has an entire packet on things you can be uh, graduating with a music degree, and some things are just you just then think about. Not so much based on race, but just again, what what have you seen? 
Um, like, did you know you could go on to be a, you know, a first channel major orchestra? That never clicks to them. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what do you mean? Like, we've never seen anybody like us. I'm like, that doesn't mean it can be done. So, yeah, I have to speak to it, but I'm sure I'm speaking to it probably from a different perspective than someone who grew up here. And um, I, maybe that's a good thing because I, I, I want to approach it with any kind of, you know, in, in grown biases or, or perspectives. I'm just speaking to the issue. Right. And I think that is good, a good thing because you're bringing a perspective that for possibly for a lot of your students, they haven't come across. Right. Um, which is like you said, if you're if you're raised in an environment where where race isn't really discussed mm -hmm. uh, on a regular basis, um, then that would create a different perspective for right. you. I, I, some, I sometimes tell the story of my parents who were raised in South Dakota in the 1950s and 60s mm -hmm. uh, and never met a black person one single time until they went to college out of state. Wow. And, uh, and what was interesting, I've, I, I talked to them, you know, growing up, I also lived in a household that didn't, ju we just didn't talk about race, partly because they, my parents didn't grow up talking about it because there was no reason to. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> You know, the only thing they knew about anybody of color was what they saw in the news, um, you know, that kind of thing. But it was never something as part of their daily life. And now, of course, I think I think life is richer now that I'm around lots of people from different cultures. So I'm not saying it's a good or bad thing. It's just that's that's the reality of of life. So it's yeah. it, I think all, all those perspectives are are good. In fact, I remember um, all, the audience has heard me say my audience has heard me say this many times, but I'm almost 40. And so I, I'm of the age where it used to be considered like the, the woke thing to do was to say, to, was to say that you don't see color. Right. Yeah. And, and because, and what that meant, and nowadays that's criticized, that concept is criticized. You're made fun of if you say that or, or flat out. But, uh, and I think the reason it's criticized is because it's, they, they, the people will conflate that with not appreciating the the richness of another culture or heritage but of course the when in the in the 90s when we used to say i don't see color that's not what we meant right right we we meant that the skin color is not the thing that i use to determine the person's yeah. value right um and 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 there are, i can still appreciate their culture and their background yeah. and, and rec recognize all those things but i don't use what what they look like as right as the reason that I like them or not like them. Right. right. Is, is that similar to how you think of it? I, I think, I think that's spot on. Um, you know, I, again, because of my, 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 the way I was brought up, I just don't look at color the way we described in the nineties. I I'm trying to get to know who you are, um, your personality, your character, you know, your mind, your thoughts. And, and, and that's what I best to determine who you are. Mm -hmm. Not 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 your skin. I think that's a very very unfair uh, barometer to use to to, to evaluate anyone. Mm -hmm. Do do you ever uh, feel concerned that that the trend seems to be moving the other direction? That we seem to be talking about skin so much of late. Yeah, I mean, if if yes, in 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 the sense of what we were just saying, if if we're going to use that now to determine. Who I am as a person, yeah, that that's of concern to me, and um, it's a very dangerous um, way to to go about life. I think very dangerous. It, it just creates so many divisions, and 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 using the term you just used, it makes our we impoverish ourselves um, by doing that. Life is not as rich that that way. It just, mm -hmm. I mean, until somebody until someone convinced me otherwise, that's just how I, I see that. Yeah, we we totally impoverish ourselves by doing that. Yeah, it's it's true, and I think there are so many uh, horrible, horrible people mm. of every of every skin color. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> oh, and yeah. and there and there are so many wonderful people exactly. from from every continent uh, and every language background and every musical tradition. Oh yeah, and and, and all these things, and I think. If uh, if we start by defining ourselves and defining each other by the things that they did not choose, exactly, 
like where they were born or exactly. to, to which parents they were born, then I think we open up a can of worms that yeah. that, that history would tell us we should keep closed. Yep. Uh, we exactly. should keep that. We should keep that can of worms closed. Yeah. Um, so you know, I'm sure we'll we'll touch on on this a little bit more, but uh, I want to go back to the ACDA performance a little bit and have yeah. you have you share um, some of your uh, your thoughts and feelings leading up to it. Uh, and and just kind of give us a play by play. What was that experience like for you, uh, oh, wow. and 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 the aftermath? Wow, um, that's an excellent question. No one has posed that question in such such a mammoth way since. Well, let me just say this: um, What was the f- emotion going into it? Absolute fear. <laughs> um, and I think and I think we kind of put some pressure on ourselves. And I, I can explain. It kind of goes to the conversation we were just having. And I have, I'm choosing my words very carefully here. I'm very aware of the fact that um, the aliens were the first historically black college and university choir to go through the entire audition process and get picked to sing at the conference. That's one. Two, I was and continue to be fully aware of the fact that um, many of my HBCU colleagues who are much older than me, you know, who, you know, they went through life in the 60s, 70s, like we just mentioned. Um, and they had some concerns, yay, some experiences. I, I, you know, I don't know exactly what the experiences were, but they, ha- they have their stone cold thoughts about these types of choirs and ACDA. Um, you know, some of them even uh, would posit that the lack of an HBC choir at ACD for all these years came down to racism, blah, 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 blah. And when I, when I came out to the University of Maryland, I was actually at a round table of some HBCU conductors when that was the general tone. And I, I being the young guy who just came out of grad school, was just like, you know, guys, I, I just can't see such a stellar organization basing our lack of participation on X, Y, Z. And the response I got to, to, to give you the cliff note version was like, well, you wait around and you're going to see. So when I got the acceptance letter, it was, it was uh, you know, it brought a lot of tears to my eyes because I knew what some of my co- fellow colleagues felt, what they said. And I also knew at the same time that there was a huge responsibility now on our shoulders to show to them to show to the general ACD public that that in fact we are uh, we do belong here. You know what I mean? It, we didn't yeah. we didn't get here by some kind of token or 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 oh, let's just highlight this black core. We got in because of what they heard on a CD <laughs> uh, uh-huh. and 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 nothing else. So so it took about a month for me to really digest the whole thing and 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 figure out. Okay, now that we are here, what are we gonna what do we want to say? Um, mm-hmm. Why do I bring that up? I'll, I'll give you two examples. You know, some 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 black colleagues would say, "Well, Jason, you should go in and do an entire African American composers program." That was one side. And then I, I remember talking to uh, a Caucasian friend of mine, a choral conductor, and I, and I was thinking at the time. I said, "You know, I want to do some Bach." And the response I got on that side was, "Are you sure you want to do that?" You know, so I, it was interesting to hear perspectives from the two sides of the track. So my small team and I, we, we started a repertoire search. And to be quite honest, we didn't start the process by saying, you know what, we're going to sing this and we want to do something about African-American poetry or this. We just, we just were trying to come up with a program that was just good musically and something that kind of showcased multiple genres. It mm-hmm. so happened. and and this literally happened towards the, the end of the process. It so happened that the first part of the program, the, the people who went to AC Day, we did six songs and we kind of did it in halves. So the first three songs were by Europeans, Bach, um, um, Caucasian people. The second half just so happened to be to be songs by people of color. It wasn't really planned. It just turned out that way. So... Mm. So I think in the end, what what we ended up doing was really showing a broad spectrum of different styles and genres that one was fun for my kids, 
challenging for my kids and, and, and hopefully that, that was felt by the people who, who were there and see the recordings. I'm going to pause briefly and remind you that if you are getting something out of this show and you feel like it's benefiting you, then there are ways that you can support the show that I would greatly appreciate. Uh, things like liking the show on Facebook, on Twitter, helping the social media algorithms promote the show, subscribing to the show and rating it on iTunes or the other apps that you listen to is a huge deal. Also, you can go to the Patreon page at patreon.com backslash Coralosophy and become a Coralosopher for as little as $3 a month and get some access to some Patreon-only content. All of those things are hugely helpful in continuing this mission of Coralosophy. Thank you. Now back to Jason Max Ferdinand. Now, do you feel that uh, that making that decision to put the music ahead of the identity of the composers was that criticized was that was that philosophy criticized or or did you was that pretty well received by your colleagues that's a great question um you know and it's a great question i don't know the answer to so to these same colleagues that i mentioned before i i don't know you know i, I didn't discuss with them leading up to ac there, hey what do you think or something uh, i mean some of my colleagues who i showed the program to prior to like bruce rogers and edward clary those guys are like Jason. This program is amazing. I think they saw very quickly what I was, what we ended up doing. Okay, here's this. We want to show that we can do this, but here's also a snippet of what we do and what we hold dear. So, mm-hmm. for I don't know what the aforementioned colleagues thought after all discussions, after their input, but um, hopefully, hopefully they saw it and and um, thought it went well. Yeah, I, I'm just curious about that because one of the you know, as we already established earlier that you and I, one of the things we have in common is that we both grew up not really talking much about race. Right. And um, and that makes us kind of unique, in, at least in today's climate of yeah. the way the way these things are, are spoken about. Um, but one of the things that I have actually become convinced of over the last few years, and, and this I jokingly use the term, uh, the, the recent, the great awakening of, of, of all the way we talk about this, um, is is the idea of representation that part of that conversation i do see and like i said i that's the story i shared with my students of by showing them examples yeah um those those things do matter and and so with the uh, in fact i'll i'll side tell a side story real quick about in in our program here i i can trace at least in my memory i've been here for 15 years um and i can trace in my memory really two key experiences with students of color that helped break down the barrier in our program to get more and more students of color to buy in and and do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, one was, and I'll change. I'll, I won't use his name because, of course, right, right. I don't. I, ju- I shouldn't. But w- there was one boy, one black boy that I had at the very beginning of my time, at least I'm at high school, who did my my beginning level men's choir all four years. He had no desire to move on to the advanced choir and he was good enough to, he just, yeah, he just didn't feel comfortable doing that. He wanted to be with the bros or whatever. (laughs) And, um, and so he stuck with it, but he got to know me really, really well over the course of those four years in that class. And eventually took a leadership role in that class because he was the older kid and he'd taken it, you know, so many years. And I had an experience with a freshman boy once during his senior year, uh, where, I was disciplining this boy who was being a jackass, mm-hmm. like just completely uh, derailing the rehearsals and not being respectful. And this was another young freshman black boy. And he stood up and put his chest to my chest and basically accused me of disciplining him because he was black. Oh, wow. And my other student, the senior boy, right, right. Uh, his name was Chris. He walked, I won't say his last name. Right. He walked he, he walked straight over from the other side of the room and put himself in between me and the other boy mm. and point, pointed his finger at him and said, that's not who Mr. Munce is. Right. Check yourself. Right. And, and from that moment on, every student of color in that class treated me differently right. because, because there was a representation from someone that they felt like stereotype or not, yeah. they felt like they could trust, and that made that was one key moment. And then a few years later, after that, in the environment started to improve uh, in, related to this, um, I had two boys 
uh, that auditioned as seniors for my advanced chamber choir, two young black boys who were like, they were the stars of the school. Like they were at varsity athletes, 4.2, 4.2 GPA kids, upper middle class kids heading to college on scholarships and all of this. And, right. and they decided to, I convinced them they were good singers and they, to try out for the chamber choir their senior year. Mm. Well, by doing that, uh, you know, at, at that time I had, I think two students of color and they were the two in the entire chamber choir. But from that point on, the younger students that would come oh, to my yeah. come come to my concerts could see themselves right. again fair stereotype or not they could see themselves on that stage right. and they could see themselves doing that and it became cool yeah. Beca yeah because because those two really cool older boys were doing it and by by me convincing those two boys to do it a, a kind of a floodgate of it doesn't matter what skin color you are started to open up in our program that's awesome and and from that point you know, it, it, it's, we are, I'm proud of now the environment where it really just doesn't matter. Mm. Um, and so, uh, you know, so the, your ACDA performance, I think has an element of that to it, whether you realized it or not, which was that, that the representation part mm. of, of what I just described was writ large on a national scale for, oh for directors of color, but also for students who were attending, right. uh, for, for the students who then I go back and I show them the most recent videos and I tell stories about how, uh, my goodness, you guys, I just came from this convention and I was really stressed out because my choir was there performing, but no, like mm -hmm. this choir <laughs> just stole the show and I was in, in this state and, and they see uh, that, that, that a choir who sings Bach doesn't have to be white. Right. Right. And, and and that matters, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's touching, man. And um, yeah, it's the whole thing is just very, very humbling to be that symbol, that representation that people can see that could kind of demystify some things. And um, it 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 brought me to tears to hear, you know, from you know, the Anson Armstrongs and the Donald Newans. Like I, I got this comment so so many times. They would say, "Man, we loved the entire program. It was stellar, but we really loved the Bach." And now, <laughs> now flip that around for my kids to hear that. They're like, "Wow, they loved the Bach." I mean, because that that was the most challenging thing for them, not just musically. When I say challenging, I'm, I mean just again that stereotype thing. Because they most of them that sang for AC Day, I, I would dare say all of them never did Bach in their entire lives. It was right. the first time in my in my years here, and especially with this group, that we were challenged, we were tackling any kind of Bach at all. So for them, that was the most challenging thing on that program. And we eventually got to the point where they could do it with ease and joy and really understand what was going on. So so for them to hear on the flip side that we really enjoyed that a whole lot, did a whole lot for them in terms of the stereotypes. So now my kids they left AC thinking, man, we could sing anything. Yeah, literally, that's that's yeah. how, that's how they feel, um, and and that's that's that will be so influential to those of them who are music majors, you know. Yeah, and it's all the singers like they'll be afraid of nothing at this point musically and culturally. And, and those of your students, I'm assuming you have some music education students, right? Exactly, in there too. And my goodness, what an influence you are spinning out. Exactly. Uh, because, you know, ultimately, I, I feel very strongly that uh, our role as choral directors is to create an environment in our rehearsals where where the barriers that the world puts on us outside mm -hmm. of the classroom mm -hmm. just don't get to come inside the door. Right. They, they don't get to be a part of it. And, you know, the world sp the, the spends this and society and the media and social media spend so much time teaching kids about all the ways that they should divide each other and divide themselves from each other mm -hmm. and all the, all the reasons that they should find who the villain is yeah. and, and point at that villain. Yeah. And, and in the choral classroom, we have the opportunity to show them that, that that doesn't have to be real for them. Right. Right. And, and I think that's a pretty remarkable thing that you're doing for your kids. And in fact, speaking of your students, I, I'm going to shift the topic just slightly more towards your students. Mm -hmm. What, what does a day in the life of an Aeolian look like? Uh, are they, 
Um, are they mostly music majors? Are they? Give me the breakdown of how that choir is. Yeah, it, it varies from year to year, but um, people are always amazed. Most of my choir, I, I haven't done the stats this year, but early on when I came to Oakwood, 2001, uh, 2001 2008, 2009, 10, about 80% of my choir were non-majors or minors. It's, it's kind of evened out or probably went up slightly high on the music major, minor side. Um, so I would dare say this year we probably had about close to half and half non-majors, music and music majors. So the day in the life of an alien could be a biochem major who's across campus doing labs and um, that sort of thing, you know, during the day. And then our alien rehearsals are pretty late in the evening. So Tuesday, Thursday, six to eight. So the kids come to rehearsal after their long days. Or music majors, I'll see them a lot because they'll be in this building. So, so the students have such very different lives, which I love because mm -hmm. the, the choir then becomes this huge melting pot, melting pot of experiences and, and 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 testimonies of what's going on in their life, and then we get to put all of those different things into the music and. Uh, and you know, I'm, I'm I'm happy, and that's something again. Being that medical person in my prior life, I think mm -hmm. kind of helps me uh, really be very accepting of that, and I and I and I encourage it a whole lot. So we have students from the ALN who are in medical school now. I just went to a graduation a couple of weeks ago. Guys got in from medical school. We have a couple of students at Harvard doing dentistry. Mm -hmm. and, and and those kids themselves will tell you that, yes, they had a great education across campus too, but singing in the aliens is what really gave them a sense of strong discipline and focus. And one guy who went to Harvard, he, he, will, he will tell you that his getting into Harvard was largely because of the aliens, because they, they were interviewing him and they said, well, tell us about this thing here. What is this alien thing you keep mentioning? And he went through, you know, at that time he... We won overseas competitions and all of that. And at the end of the interview, they said to him, you know what? We want you here because you've already proved that you could balance a lot of different things. And that's the type of student we need here. So um, the students come from all kinds of backgrounds. Um, many of the students come from all over the country. Um, Oakwood University is a, is a school that's part of the Seventh Adventist tradition. So we get students from all over the world. And probably my choir this year, I probably had maybe two people that are from Huntsville. Everyone else is from, you know, wherever, England, France, California, New York, from all over. So that, that gives us a, a, another sense of uh, tons of different backgrounds. Yeah, I've got I've got a student right now that I really I really want to send to you. Okay, okay. <laughs> I, I, I uh, I've been talking to her about it already. In fact, she knows that I'm doing this interview with you, okay, and she's cool. freaking out. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I'll tell you about that off off the air later. Okay, cool. So so with with all of these students from these diverse study backgrounds mm -hmm. that you have in your in your choir, as they're approaching the ACDA convention, many of them probably didn't know really what ACDA was, especially since you mentioned you right. guys were the first HBCU right. to, to go, let alone if they're not all choir people, right. like a, as a profession. So did you, do you feel like anybody was kind of blind, any of your singers were kind of blindsided? <laughs> well, by... you, well, yes and no. You, you're very correct in the fact that, uh, you know, I, I would keep saying ACDA, ACDA. And they knew what it meant. And I would try my best to describe the magnitude of the whole thing. And I, and I know, I knew many of them was kind of like, okay, it's just going over. Um, when I mentioned Bruce Rogers coming in, Bruce, Bruce took intentional time to try and explain that even more. And, you know, sometimes coming from someone else, it, it kind of has a bigger impact. So by the time Bruce came towards the end of January, I think they really started to grasp what we were getting into as best they could at that time. When they got to Kansas, it, it was like, oh, this is, uh, this is pretty deep. So most of them probably didn't really get it, uh, but I, 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 I'm fairly confident saying most of them, or if not all of them got it once we got there, and they mm -hmm. definitely got it once they walked out on that stage. They they were like, okay, now we see what our teacher has been telling us about this entire time. And I, one other thing I didn't mention, you know, Oakwood being a school of, we ended last school year with what, 1,600 something students. 
Mm-hmm. You know, we had no business being at AC Day, you know, competing against the, the biggest schools. So, you know, they 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 should be very proud of themselves even to even to get there. But I, I think they got it now. I think they got it after the performance. Oh, I would imagine. Yeah, they would have seen see that and the reaction from the crowd. What was that like for you? That that just the huge eruption of applause. It was it was surreal. Um it it kind of caught us off guard. And especially at the first performance, I think it happened at the second one too, when we stopped at that halfway point. Um, you know, for us, we thought we were just going to acknowledge the, the applause. But people stood up and I had to kind of gesture to my clock, that, hey, I'm on, a, I'm on time here. So, you know, please sit down. But it, it really took us by surprise. But it was so, it was so, uh, it was such a release after all the months of rehearsing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, and, and, Right before we walked out on stage, I reminded the group of, I said, do you guys remember the first day we pulled out Bach? I'm like, oh my gosh, it was it was like hell. Um, and remember where the song was in October? Do you remember where the song was in December? And here, here we came at the point now of actually making the music happen. And it was such a release that, that people received it well. And uh, I was just so proud of my students. I really was. Uh, it was just a shining moment for, for them. Oh, I bet. Yeah, the, and I imagine it, like we said before, at that moment, any of your students kind of didn't get how how much a performance like that would could mean to the audience. But then also, I, I'm sure some meaning was created in the singers at those in those moments too. Did you guys get a chance to reflect, really? Oh yeah, we we did. Um... You know, well, you know, we, we did two performances. You don't have much time in between. So, and I didn't want to stop then to do that kind of reflection. But we, we took time after at, at Kansas and even when we came back just to reflect on what this means for us as a group, what this means for everyone individually. I just trying, to, I always try to take away life lessons from everything we do. And um, I'm sure because of that A State performance, all of them will be better people just, just for having been there and, and, and doing that. So we, we had tons of time to reflect and uh, just really, really humbled that, that, that we, we pulled it off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, that's really remarkable. I, I the uh, funny story of, of the concept of not understanding the magnitude of ACDA we had uh, for our performance <clears throat> on Saturday night during the convention, we had a collaboration with a local uh, jazz singer here in Kansas city named Millie Edwards. Mm-hmm. And we did this uh, weird fusion jazz classical i don't even know how to describe it if you weren't there it's hard it's hard to describe um and and she was essentially it's a passion story and she was the the evangelist um the the gospel singer is the evangelist clips of this not yeah i've seen clips of this. yeah it's it was it was a really cool piece but she's not from the choir world like she doesn't live in that world. She lives in the in the clubs here in Kansas yeah. City, and she sings jazz and in, in the in the nightclubs and stuff. And so I, I, we hire her for this, and she has some choir director friends from uh, from other circles. And she was telling me the story at kind of our after party uh, a couple times afterwards that she did not understand really what this was. She just it was an opportunity to sing at the Coffin Center. Right. It was really cool music. And then one of her choir director friends like grabbed her like a couple of weeks before and just said, this is a big effing deal. <laughs> right? And, I, and I, I'll use the, the safe language since I, I don't want to put on the explicit language on the podcast. But um, but uh, and she was like, it is it like, why is right. this such a big why is this such a big deal? And, and he was like, well, it's like if for choir directors, it's like the Oscars. Right. <laughs> right. Right. And she was like, oh, wow. Yeah. You know, so it, it is if you don't if you're not a choir nerd then you yeah. don't really you don't really know what it is that is going on there right, right. So it's uh but it, yeah it was a pretty amazing thing and and I, I also got a chance to sit in on your on the music and worship session that you guys did oh, yeah, yeah. at the cathedral uh which was a really neat neat thing uh of course i i, I was kind of thinking i mean i wish i could have heard that your whole other program in yeah. that space in that space that would yeah. have been really cool <laughs> Yeah. Well, it was funny. We we had a rehearsal for the conference in that space the day before. So <laughs> I guess we got the experience and no one else did. <laughs> oh, and wow. That, that space is pretty amazing. Yeah. 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 We do a concert there every year also. Nice. It's a, a really, really nice place to sing. Yeah. 
Um, so I want to move now to the um, so a little bit more nuts and bolts of your philosophy uh, it, with your ensemble. Mm -hmm. How would you describe the sound that you go for uh, in different? I mean, I know you sing lots of different types of music, but if, is there an overarching philosophy of the way you teach your students to sing? Um, you know, Chris, I, in my eleven years here, that my philosophy changes. Maybe not changes is the right word. It 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 progresses and develops as I age and experience different things. Mm -hmm. I know one big thing for us here, kind of being again going back to being an HBCU. The HBCU choir tends to have a certain sound. The black voices get together and it tends to be a lot of um, very dark and a lot of vibrato. And it's something over the years here I've had to kind of really chisel away at to the point where you know. You know, you could sing straight tone pretty effortless, effortlessly now. So that here has been a work for me to get to that point. But in terms of sound, you know, I, I always talk to my students at the beginning of each year about two, the two philosophies. I mean, there are more than two, but I'm, I'm using two as an example. When it comes to groups, and when I say groups now, I'm talking about, you know, small groups, quartets, sextets, all the way up to choirs. And the two, two philosophies that I see are... The ones where you could have a group like, for example, uh, there was a famous Seventh Adventist gospel quartet called the King's Heralds Quartet. lasted for maybe 50 years or something. The King's Heralds, you could, you could hear a recording from 1968 and compare it to a recording from 1998, and it sounds like the same guys. Mm. But it's not the same guys. But their philosophy is this is the King's Heralds sound. So if someone okay. in the group, they try to find a singer who kind of fits them all. That's one philosophy. One group, and we have one continuous sound, despite the member changes. There's some other groups where, you know, my favorite acapella group of all time, the most winning acapella group in history, Take Six. Yep. Which, you know, Take Six was formed right here on Oakwood's campus. So they've had a couple member changes uh, by now. And... When those people change, the vibe of the group kind of changed, and they went along with what that new person brought to the group. So mm -hmm. they tend to kind of go, and so so those these, the group that has the same sound for decades, the group that changes the sound and is malleable to different people in the group. I tend to go with that that one. So when my mm -hmm. groups come in year year after year, I say to them, "Hey, I'm not trying to make you sound like the group last year. I want this group to sound the best you." Um, now, are there things from last year's group I probably want to bring over here? Sure, we'll work on, but we're not going to work on it as a copy and paste thing. It's going to be here something stylistically or something, you know, in the in the spectrum of sound that we want to do. And once I establish that, that they are free to be done, it's amazing how it just frees them up to just, and then I could start molding, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, let's do this for this. Let's do that for there. But, you know, I, I, I just really try to go for healthy singing, man, um, for kids to be free. Um, you know, and I, don't, I don't want any kind of vocal damage going on here. Just, you know, just relax and, and, and do you and be your voice. And uh, yeah. maybe we could get deeper and deeper in terms of like how I end up placing people. It kind of goes along with that philosophy, too. But I just want them to sing their best. And that will give us the best choral sound that we can give for one any particular year. Right. I, I agree with the the side of the camp that you described, which is that as the singers change, the sound yeah. will have to change to a certain degree. But I also think that that there you mentioned that there are some musical concepts and some yeah. sound concepts that would need to carry over because they're they're, they're important to you as the conductor. Right. Um, what can you articulate some of those yeah, like? I, yeah, I, I could articulate them as best I can. So um, we 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 like to be very consistent and very uh, clear. And this this kind of crosses many different concepts. For example, uh, let's talk about dynamics. For example, um, it, it dawned on me maybe four or five years ago now. That, you know these Italian terms we use, like you know, I'll say, "Hey, mezzo forte." Yeah. But it dawned on me, if I go across town to a different choir and I say, okay, let's sing this mezzo forte, that could mean a totally different thing to them. So mm -hmm. we came up with this system of dynamics where we use numbers now. Um, ah, yeah, we do that too. You do that too, right. So so you kind of aware where I'm going. So, so, so now when I say, hey, right here, this passage is two. 
now everyone everyone in my group knows exactly what that feels like in their voice mm -hmm. to create the overall two dynamic 41 or you know this past year we got up to a dynamic of 15 so one all the way up to 15 so everybody now is very unified on where we are dynamically um so a question i got a lot after ac day was how do you get your kids to sing that soft like we just never heard pianos that soft and it, it kind of came from that um we started we started by making i'll always say let's sing the softest we can without sounding brittle and eventually at time, it, we realized that we could bring that one dynamic, it even got softer and softer, but very, very controlled and, and full. So, so that's one philosophy I have that kind of crosses techniques too. Just being clear that everyone in the group understands what this concept is. So we have right. no confusion and it's very clean and clear. Um, yeah. you know, so when it comes to colors too, so... I talked about, you know, I've had to work a lot on getting to the straight tone side. So all the way now from straight tone to a full, full vibrato, we have the different demarcations of colors in between that. And for me, that's huge. And it saves so much time. And it just gives me so, so, many, so many tools to use in a given performance or song. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. Are the way our... Um number system works mm -hmm. which i stole i stole from one of my professors in college but then i've added my over the years i've added yeah. my my own like definitions for everything we do a scale of one to ten mm -hmm. and a one we define as as soft as you can sing with your vocal folds fully approximating right and it's not breathy right so if it's breathy i'll, I'll sometimes i'll make fun of them and say it's a 0.5 like, <laughs> we don't we, yeah. don't we don't we don't need the 0.5 we need to find our one yeah and then and then I, i'll tell them that a 10 is as loud mm -hmm. as you can sing without straining without pushing without yelling mm -hmm. um uh, any kind of as you said earlier vocal damage things or louder than beautiful right you know right uh, you know that kind of thing and so then uh, then they learn from a young age to to make sure that they're starting on the breath and right. but at the same time you're, you're exactly right mezzo forte does not mean the same thing to two different singers no nope. um and you know i've got a big loud voice and mezzo forte to me is fortissimo for a exactly. high school boy you know exactly so yeah that's important that's really good yeah so um so what about uh, this idea then? If you are, you may, I'm going to go back to the topic you said about the struggle over the years to get the singers to be flexible enough to take the vibrato out mm -hmm. and to sing in certain styles. Um, do you feel like your singers are still able then after you've kind of trained them in that way mm -hmm. to kind of code switch back into a more gospel style? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that's the beauty about students here at Oakwood. They, oh yeah, a drop of a hat, they could flip back into that. Uh, sometimes they flip into it when I don't want it, <laughs> but uh, right. but uh, yeah, they 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 never forget how to do that, like at all. Uh, right. It's so interesting. Like on Friday nights here on campus, the the young people have this this uh, kind of church service, I guess you would call it, that they run. So every now and then, I'll see some of my singers up, up on the press teams. Uh, I mean, at that point, they just, you know, just they just do what they do in, in church. So they 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 could flip back at a drop of a, a drop of a hat, which is pretty mm -hmm. cool to me. Do you uh, in the Aeolians? I'm sure you take advantage of that. Like, uh, to, uh, of course, if you're going to do something that's more traditional gospel, mm -hmm. um, it, do you have to? Uh, here would be my uh, my question out of ignorance because I've never stood in front of actually any choir that is. Mm -hmm uh as racially unified right, or right. culturally unified so do you have to say anything or do you have to say here's a piece and they just recognize that it's gospel and they just do it yeah. you know it's, it's kind of weird over the years we, we noticed that we do less and less gospel in our programs now i'm maybe like one song for concert or something but but it i tend to almost then take what they'll do in church and even go a step further. And I'll say, guys, okay, we got to sing this now like we were singing at Carnegie Hall. So it's gospel, but it's very stylized, still stylized and nuanced, which uh, which makes it really, really exciting for me. And it's interesting, just, just as a, a, a sidebar here, I don't know if you know the name Donald Lawrence. He's like mm -hmm. one of America's uh, most winning, most popular gospel artists. He's out of Chicago. But I've watched Donald Lawrence over the years approaches gospel music, and it's so it's so choral, 
And uh, really? a few weeks ago, I was talking to him on Facebook Messenger. You know, just asking about his background. Then he says, oh, yeah. I remember singing for Robert Shaw when he did my honor call in high school. I was like, there it is. And I'm uh-huh. Dale Wallen. And he's like, oh, man, I love those guys. I'm like, ding, 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 ding. So for all these years, I've been admiring Donald Lawrence because he is, is very clean, very stylized, not just this brash type of gospel. So I kind of like that approach where the kids still know that natural thing, but we still bring those choral elements and, and nuance to it. I'll even like change the key, just bring it down a little lower. So mm-hmm. I don't have to feel like they're really, really, really pushing that out. So, yeah, so so we take that and we kind of morph it into what do you call more classical gospel. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now, are you teaching, uh, when you teach some of those concepts of classical choral techniques and, mm-hmm. and ideas, are, are most of your students coming to that for the first time with you, or are they coming from high school programs that do that as well? It, it's a mixed bag, Chris. Um, you and I've noticed over the years, it tends, it tends to be getting more and more kids who are not getting that background, which kind of breaks my heart. Um, so it's a mixed bag. Um, I'll get some kids who come from great high school programs, kids who come in here, sight singing, singing on solfege. And then I'll get this kid with a great voice, but all they've known is something in church or, you know, some no idea about notes going up and down that sort of thing so sometimes i have to make that hard decision like what do i do this with a kid like a kid like that do i turn them completely away some of them you know they've, they've caught them very very quickly you know like they've learned how they've learned how to sight sing and learn the choral techniques very very quickly but um so i, I got a complete mixed bag here a complete mixed bag which mm-hmm. is fun but scary all at the same time yeah, no, I imagine it would change the way you'd have to address the topic. Yeah, um, because you can't, you know, you, it, it'd be a lot like teaching high school in this. In that, I also get a lot of students who already know how to do a lot of things, mm-hmm. and then some that have just never done this before. Yeah, uh, and so it, that, that in your at Oakwood though, will they typically? Let's say you have a student who doesn't have that background from high school. Will they typically start in like the university choir right, and, right. and then they'll make the Aeolians exactly. after a certain? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, so when I did both choirs, it, you know, it was, was virtually smoother just by virtue of me doing both groups. So I would put some of those kids in university choir and after a year or two, then they'll switch over to the Aeolians. And over the years, we've had a high percentage of Aeolians who were formal members the university core and, and, and that's the way it still is yeah okay so um one other question i wanted to ask you related to uh earlier topic we were chatting about with stereotypes and stereotyping mm-hmm. of uh, culturally for musicians have do you ever and you don't have to call anybody out of course yeah. mm-hmm. but have you have you ever been the victim of that uh, as a as a black conductor in the u.s having people assume that you're an expert in certain styles of music or have you, have you ever come across that? You know, fortunately, Chris, um, unless I was just naive to what was going on in the room, I, I don't think I've experienced that. Um, thankfully, I was just talking to another, someone who I just met on last week, African-American guy, and he he just had a plethora of stories where he, you know, felt like he was being discriminated against or pigeonholed or something. And I, and I could honestly say I haven't, I haven't felt that. Um, mm-hmm. uh, when I went to the University of Maryland, I didn't, I didn't feel that at all. And uh, when I, when I went into that program, I was the only African American in the, in the choral program at the time. It was, it was small. It was like five or six of us. But I never felt like they tried to pigeonhole me with, or assume that I was just this expert in gospel or the spirituals or something now now would they ask me for advice on spirituals yes but i don't i didn't feel like they were asking me that because that was all they thought i knew or right thing like right. that um, so so no I, I haven't felt that thank thank god yeah there was recently uh a i don't know if you've ever been on the the facebook group called i'm a choir director um yeah, no but- I'll check that out yeah, it's it's a it's an interesting place. Uh, <laughs> I'll check it out right after this. <laughs> yeah, it's there was a a big long contentious thread just yesterday about spirituals actually. Hmm. Um that uh, the the claim in the original post was that to for conductors to stop using the spiritual as the fun piece at the end of the concert. Hmm. 
which I, I, I mean, I totally understand that, especially if the, uh, if the spiritual is being presented outside of its proper context mm-hmm. and be, and being used as fluff yeah. in the program that I, I can totally see. Yeah, I could get that how, too. How that's demeaning. Yeah. Um, because, but I could also see that you could do that to almost any style of music by not under, not teaching the singers and the audience what it's meant to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, of course, the contention in the post came from other folks then responding to, well, what if it's a fun spiritual? You know, there are, are right. is there some spirituals were written to be to be expressions of joy and yeah. a, a release from. Yeah, the joy of these spirituals. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so what are your thoughts about that? Well, I, like like you said, I could see why. The person perhaps made a comment because at times it, it does seem like things are programmed like that. Well, here we come to the ending. Let's just kind of do it. And and sometimes it would be my inner thoughts as well. Like, why did they put that there? Which was part of the reason, Chris, why if you think back to what we programmed for AC Day, we intentionally did not program a jubilee, a beat kind of show spiritual for the end. That was very, very intentional. And Good. The, the spiritual that we did, we chose to go to opposite way something real soft and mellow the, the dust and my lord with a morning which was a really really soft song mm-hmm. and that was with intent because i didn't want to you know it's not that i have this big beef with anything but i just didn't want to make it up here okay here comes the the black hole doing the spiritual at the end just to kind of bring the house down kind of thing but um i've heard arguments too about why do we always put, can we put the spirituals at the beginning or in the middle or someplace else? Um, you know, I have my thoughts about that too. Like it just kind of depends on how you program, you know, do you have some, a reason or theme for doing that? Um, so I, I kind of, I'm, I'm answering your question without really answering it. I kind of see probably what the person was trying to post in terms of, we always get the, uh, you know, Joshua for the battle or the Elijah Rock at, at the end, that's the kind of, as a showstopper kind of thing. And that person probably feels as the, the genre is being made a, 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 not a mockery, but a mockery of, or not taken as seriously as, say, the Brahms that came at the beginning of the program. But mm-hmm. uh, I, like you said, though, you could take anything from any from any time period and and, and put it out of context and make it seem something that it should not be. Right. So right. I think it just kind of goes to, you know, well then let's educate the audiences. You know, if, if this is how you feel, then do something about maybe changing the perspective. If that's what you think the perspective is, you know, my thing right. is that don't make a post and just kind of stop there. Let's, let's, let's educate and try to make people feel that, Hey, okay. So there is a deeper meaning to, the spiritual than just being a, you know, then if that's how, where you feel, then make it your obligation to educate. Right. I think it goes, it goes back to the stereotyping a little bit. It's it, if, if the spiritual is being used without any thought of what it can offer the program, other than just syncopated rhythms at the end of the concert, exactly. Then you're absolutely putting it in a, category that prioritizes it less than the Brahms that you did exactly. in the middle and and doesn't recognize its historical value, its context that it was intended to be used yeah. in. Uh, but that also at the same time doesn't mean that there aren't contexts that 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 where that using it at the end of the program as a showstopper mm-hmm. wouldn't be appropriate. There would probably be some spirituals. In fact, I would argue that Moses Hogan made his living uh, exactly. writing, you know, ar- arranging spirituals for that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and the way he set them, like, cause he didn't have to choose all the kind of orchestration of the acapella spirituals the right. way he did. Right. Uh, if he didn't intend them to be like these big audience pleasing, mm-hmm. you know, moments, but it's also not the only way you could set a spiritual. Right. Right. You know? and, 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 and if you stick with Moses Hogan, I mean, there were some other arrangements of his, that um, kind of have the effect of the My Lord Water Morning, like very somber and very serious. Like I think of his setting of We Shall Walk to the Valley in Peace is one of my favorites. Oh, love that. Right, yeah. that that would do the exact opposite. Um, so, 
you know, again, just programming and perspective and educating audiences. That's that's where I feel. And, you know, even the summer, I'm going through the process now of picking some programs for, like, um, all state quarters and that sort of thing. And, and, and I'm having that same debacle. How do I end these programs? Mm-hmm. And, I'm, and hopefully I can figure that out in the next few weeks. Like, do I go with, you know, do I go with a showy spiritual? Or, and, and I'm kind of tending to, you know, I'm probably – letting the cat out of the bag. But I think I'm going to make an an, uh, intentional decision to end my programs with something that um, showcases more unity and humanity and as opposed to, oh, here comes the spiritual at at the end. So I'm trying to figure that out even even as we speak. So that's that's a great question. And I'm going to check out that. What's the name of that page? I am a conductor. Uh, I'm a choir director. I'm a choir director. Gotcha. I'm going to check it out. Yeah, it's got some interesting conversations on there, and but you know, I, I, the, oh, and I noticed too, you're coming to Missouri for an all-state choir. I am, I am. So, so if my kids do their job and and get the get prepared for that audition, you might see, see some of my, awesome. my students. Awesome, I would there. love to see them. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be fun. That'll be yeah. fun. Yeah. So, um, the, I think the 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 biggest thing that I. Uh, was interested in having this conversation with you today, and I appreciate you coming and spending the time with me and doing this. It's oh. been so much fun. I've, I've enjoyed getting to know you through oh, this no process. Problem. Likewise. Uh, you know, I, I think I was ultimately motivated to do this conversation because, uh, and I and I didn't know how it would turn out in the sense that I didn't know if you're, uh, how, how you would feel about some of the things that I see uh, regarding these stereotypes and and uh, racial barriers that we have in our profession, uh, but I I really felt strongly, and this will be an, I can't decide if this is a strange way to put it or not, but you can decide. Okay, uh, is that th- by your performance itself at ACDA, I could tell that you felt a similar way about some of these things that I did mm-hmm. because of the way you programmed it. Yeah. I could I could tell um, in in that there is there is a certain element of kind of like I said about the the woke nineties where mm-hmm. where we we have identities but through our race yeah but but they aren't the most important ones and as musicians my feeling is that our first identity is as as a musician mm-hmm. like our, what it you know I've had I had a conversation once with I was very fortunate for years to work with an organist at, at a the church that I used to be employed at, uh, uh, an African-American y- uh, young organist slash drummer slash opera si- slash opera singer <laughs> who, who just, uh, and tall, handsome, looked like Denzel, just not fair. Just totally not, <laughs> yeah. not fair at all. And um, we, we talked a lot about this concept that, that music is so great because we get to work together and collaborate on these musical projects and we get to decide if we are having a successful experience or not based on solely what the music sounds like when we're done. Yeah. We don't, we don't have to, you know, I don't have to say he's a really good organist for a black guy. Right. I can just say he's He's a good good organist. organist. Exactly. And, and, and in music, uh, you know, I'm sure there are other, I'm sure athletes feel that way in a certain sense too. Like the, the camaraderie that they, they experience on the field together means like we get, we are a team because of the the product we put together on on the field. And I I think in music, we should be approaching it that way too, which is that, uh, yeah, we recognize each other's backgrounds and we recognize that your, the beauty, beauty of your heritage and the beauty of my heritage. But when we, put on our cleats, so to speak, yeah, yeah. and and go in and start rehearsing, ultimately we're just human. Right. And I felt I felt like that humanity came through your your program wow. at, at ACDA. Uh, to the point where I thought, you know what? I want to have this talk with him mm. and and see if if that is a, was a philosophical whether intentional or not. And it sounds like some of what you did was intentional. Yeah. Though. Yeah. Uh, I mean the, the way you summed that up was pretty captivating, just me listening to it. But um, I, again, like, like I just mentioned in choosing my programs now going forward for all states and stuff, I, I think a big part of what I, wanna, what I wanna do going forward is, you know, try and bring people together with, with the music and the unity, humanity kind of theme. And, um, you know, 
and you mentioned life just taking its course sometimes that that is their program you know it's funny Chris I'm actually looking at my big whiteboard here in my office that had some of the notes during our programming months and um life just has a way of taking its course not program took took its course um there, there were little things little connecting things that just came up and we didn't even plan it like like for example um you know the penultimate song was the old standard smile um that our friend Cedric Dent from Take 6 arranged and then Cedric actually came up to sing and the first line of the song after that says we smile but oh you know it was like so I was like, oh my gosh, these two things go together and we couldn't plan it any better. It just kind of happened. But it, it also let us know, let me know that uh, it was just the right way to end the program. Meaning, we wanted to say, hey, yeah, we are all black choir, but look, this is music. This is about the music. This is about us as people. Um, mm-hmm. there's, there's a song that we sang uh, this year called um, Karamoos and it ends with this line that says, um, all all that inhabit this great earth are kindred and and united by birth, which I think is just just a powerful testimony of what what life is. And uh, um, if people felt that that theme came through and came through very strong, I think I think we succeeded in doing what what, what we tended to do. But you you are right on it. Um, we try to bring just everything together so that people could feel feel something tugging at hearts and not just not just leaving saying, oh, that was a great musical performance, but we wanted to tug at hearts and, and hopefully that's mm-hmm. what it did. Yeah. Oh, it absolutely did. And uh, you know, I I think that what that performance did will uh will resonate uh for for years and and all the impact that it would have on music educators and your the future music educators from your choir and and all of that you know all those things really matter uh, i think it's a beautiful thing so uh, i will i will stop us there this was just such a fun conversation and we're just gonna have to do it again sometime oh, let's let's do it let's do yeah. it really this, if, thank you so much this was refreshing yeah a really good conversation and i will uh be in touch with you after we sign off, so that your that the audience can uh, learn more about you and 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 have you send me any kind of links for what the aliens are doing next and things you oh. want people to know about and and that okay. way we have a, kind of a one stop shop once you go on oh, the show sure. notes of the of the page for all the things that you're doing and mm-hmm. uh, and that would be great we'd love to promote your activities in that way oh, thank, uh, you, thank so you so much. yeah thank you so much for coming on and talking with me no problem Chris thank you. Thank you so much for sticking around to the end of the episode. It is listeners like you that keep this show going. And by digging into these topics in long form and in context and understanding the humanity of the person we're talking to, we can talk about anything. So if you stuck with this all the way to the end, my assumption is you probably feel the same way at some level to the point where you want to get involved in these kinds of conversations in a way that is not the social media way, which is blurbs, which is out of context, which is impersonal, and leads to dehumanization of each other. Frankly, I'm just sick of it. That's why I said at the beginning of this episode that this conversation was a breath of fresh air. I'm a better person for having had this conversation, and I want to think at some level you're a better person for having listened in on a conversation like this where we can talk about each other's common humanity and how music helps us achieve that and helps us see that in each other. So thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. A reminder that you can check out ryanmain.com and sightreadingfactory.com and enter Coralosophy at checkout at both of those websites to check out their awesome services and get a 10% discount as you do it. You can also like on all the social media posts, subscribe, on your iTunes app, share when you see the episodes come on and and share a personal story if you're willing uh, of something that you liked in the episode, something that you enjoyed. It's even okay if you share to challenge something in the episode and say, hey, these guys are just off their rockers. The bottom line is this is a conversation that we want to spread. We want more and more people to have this conversation. So if you could do any of those things or all of those things to help the mission of this show continue, I would greatly appreciate it. 
Also, you can head on over to the Coralosophers Facebook group and continue this conversation as well. I'll be posting the episode there, and it's a great place for you to respond, to shout out your favorite quotes, to shout out your most interesting moments in the show that you want to react to. I'd love to get more and more of that conversation going. As always, you can email at coralosophy at gmail.com to let us know what you think. Stay tuned for the next episode coming to you real soon.